Um, okay, so a family of phenomena where your perceptual experiences are influenced by your cognitive states, and one central question about that family of phenomena is a psychological one of what psychological mechanisms underlie cognitive penetration or can underlie it. And then there's an epistemic question about how cognitive penetration in its various forms might affect the epistemic roles of experience. And one set of answers to both of these questions um, appeals to probabilistic frameworks to try to analyze both of these things. Um, so on the psychological front, um, on this kind of analysis, cognitively penetrated experiences uh, reflect what the cognitive system deems most probable, and that, in turn, be influenced by emotions, fears, for example, desires, and so on, or just from keeping statistics, either doing that well or doing that poorly. Um, and then on the epistemological front, um, on this sort of framework, you try to analyze the epistemic impact of cognitive penetration on experience by focusing on its interface with between experience and credences. Um, okay, um, now on this sort of framework it has to be explained or analyzed um, how experience can reflect what the cognitive system deems most probable. And what I want to talk about today is one kind of answer to that question. So I want to discuss the idea that perceptual experiences in their very structure are built to reflect probabilistic information, and they're built to reflect that by consisting in degree relations to contents, where those degree relations can be measured by probability. So I'm going to call those kinds of relations proto-confidences, and I'll explain a little bit more about what they are as we go along. So first, some starting assumptions um, about I'm, I'm making about perceptual experiences. So uh, one starting assumption here is that I'm thinking of them as associated with contents that characterize, in the visual case, the way things look, sound, in other cases. Um, and those are a kind of accuracy condition, so that if your visual experience has the content, it's a red cube, that content's accurate only if it's a red cube is true, relative to the setting in which you have the experience. So just as a starting idea, perceptual experiences consist in relations to contents, and then those contents together with the relations that you stand into them reflect the phenomenal character of the experience, and I'm going to call that relation perceptual seeming. Um, this is a phenomenal logical category, meaning you can you can stand in the perceptual seeming relation to a content even if you were hallucinating, you match that to be perceiving. Okay, so here are two questions that the proto confidence analysis uh, sets out to answer. Okay, so the first question is: Is this perceptual seeming relation a degree relation? Okay, so that's like asking, um, given my starting assumptions, that's like asking whether it's possible to be presented with the same content more or less strongly. Um, and then if the answer to that is yes, the strength with which you're presented with the content on, um, it will get analyzed as the strength of the perceptual seeming relation. This is how, this is according to the proto-confidence uh, analysis. Um, or, um, now, that's not the only way to analyze the idea that you could be presented more or less strongly with the content. There could be differences that account for differences in strength of presentation. So we should distinguish just conceptually between like having a degree property, so perception or belief or intuition can be strong or weak, that's to say that those things have a degree property, um, and we should distinguish between that and this different idea that a thing, perception or belief or intuition, for example, is actually a degree relation. So I'm focusing on the idea that says um, the perceptual seeming relation is, it's, is that we analyze strength of being presented with things in terms of the degree uh, relation. Okay. So just to give you an example of um, the strength of how the strength of the perceptual seeming relation could vary, um, uh, what yeah. do I press? This one? Just that. This, yeah. this one. All right. Okay. Um, um, the the degrees of the relation would then correlate with how strongly you're presented with things as they're characterized by the content. So here are some examples: cat in the fog as opposed to cat in the clear sky. Um, the phenomenon that's trying to be analyzed by saying that the perceptual seeming relation comes in degrees is the phenomenon where you're more strongly presented with the cat in the clear one than in the foggy one. Um, you look at the blue when it's unmediated as opposed to seeing the blue through the orange. Um, you can be presented with blue both times, um, but more strongly in the unmediated case, um, more strongly presented with the drawn triangle than the Kinesa triangle, for example. Okay. So that's the idea that, that, uh, um, that, according to this phenomenal constraint on what degree perceptual seeming relation would be, um, the different degrees of perceptual seeming are going to be phenomenally different. And these are some examples of what that is supposed to be illustrated, how it's supposed to be illustrated. 
Okay, now there's a further question. If you think that the Perceptual assuming relation is a degree relation, a further question is, is it the kind of degree relation that where the degrees can be measured by probability? And that brings us to what I call the proto-confidence analysis. So here I'm defining it on page two. Um, proto-confidences are degree relations to propositions that can be measured by probability and are not themselves levels of confidence or credence or anything else doxastic. So as I'm using the term credence, um, those are degrees of confidence that can be measured by probability. Confidence, by definition, is something doxastic. So when I say proto-confidence, the reason I'm calling it that is that it's a non-doxastic precursor. Proto is a precursor to confidence. Now in English, this root proto, sometimes if you have a proto f, a proto f is also an f, like a proto martyr, a martyr. But other times, a proto f is not an f. So proto humans, not humans. Okay. Other people who have discussed the same idea have used different terminology, but this is my terminology. Okay, so I am very interested in this idea because it seems to have interesting motivations and consequences. One motivation it has is that um, it, seems, it promises to put perceptual experience into the same currency as perceptual processing if perceptual processing is itself probabilistic. So you might think, we just understand better how experience is integrated with perceptual processing and the rest of cognition if it belonged to the same informational currency as probabilistic representations. And then a kind of parallel idea applies instead of the interface between experience and the psychological pre processing that leads to it, the same idea applies to the interface between um, experience and credences. So you might think, well, if we just understand a lot better how experience enables us to form credences if experiences were proto-confidences. So I've written down an argument that develops this idea I call the face value argument. The first premise says, by taking your experience at face value, you can end up with credences. The second premise is that if you end up with credences when you take your experience at face value, then the experiences must have been proto-confidences. They must have been structured in the same way as credences. So that's a little argument for proto-confidences that develops a second motivation. Notice that the first premise of this argument is not taking any stand on the epistemology of the situation, not taking any stand on whether the credences you would form by taking experiences at face value, as you can according to premise one, would ever be made reasonable by the experiences. And that brings me to the third motivation for this idea, which is that um, concerns the epistemic role of experience in response to credences. And that's the motivation that says, if experiences were proto-confidences, we would understand better two things. First, which credences to form in response to your experience? Which credences are properly the ones that you should form? So here, proto-confidences are promising to identify some doxastic destination you could reach from your experience. Um, and then the second version of this idea is that, um, the second part of this motivation is that uh, if experienced in proto-confidences, we'd be able to understand better what the proprietary epistemic contribution of experience is. So here the proto-confidences are reported to identify just what the rational contribution of experience is, rather than the doxastic destination you should end up with in response to your experience. Okay, I'll be talking more about this difference, just in case you're taking a moment to sink it. So this is what I'm going to do. Um, since I want to know, ultimately, you know, is this... It, do proto-confidences contribute to a useful framework for analyzing cognitive penetration, both its psychological underpinnings and its epistemic consequences? Um, I want to think through um, whether this framework that's very thoroughly probabilistic by putting experiences into the same currency in the form of proto-confidences, does that help us? Any? Does that help us? And I'm going to focus on, um, on the epistemic interface. So here, that's my goal, uh, is I want to develop and then criticize both of these versions of the epistemic motivation for proto-confidences, both the one about doxastic destinations and also the one about rational contributions. Okay, let me just say two more things about why else it matters for epistemology, whether there are proto-confidences. So I've already mentioned one, it might give us a framework, it would give us a framework for analyzing cognitive penetration and its epistemic impact. But it also has these other interesting features. So for example, that face value argument I mentioned, um, um, that opens the possibility of what you might think of as a kind of super empiricism. The idea that your first probability function in your mind could like come in through your eyeballs. Um, so uh, on one way of thinking of things, you know, you, uh, well, on this, on this picture, uh, the expressive capabilities that we end up with when we allegedly have 
um, when, we, when we represent probability functions, um, sometimes it's just positive as something we you know always have. Um, but on this picture, on the super empiricist picture, um, you might think, well, how does the mind get to come to be able to represent um, anything probabilistic at all? And then one idea is like, you know, it's because your experience was structured in a certain way. Um, it was structured like proto-competences, and you kind of grow the expressive capabilities you need to form probabilistic opinions only after and because of these experiences. So that's sort of interesting. Um, okay, and then another reason it matters is it would, it would provide a response to some skeptics about credences, like Richard Holton, um, on the grounds that the basic psychological phenomenon of um, you know, representing probabilistic information is found already in perception. Okay, so um, that's why it matters. Now, um, I'll, put, I'll tell you what I actually think about this, or at least how I'm going to get there. Um, our main question is, how might these proto-competences help us analyze the epistemic interface between experience and credences? And my strategy for answering this question um, is, since is, this is my reasoning behind my strategy. So this is my strategy, and it embodies a kind of reasoning. I'm thinking, it would help a lot. It would help us analyze things a lot if they, if proto-competences simplified and illuminated this interface. So I thought what we should do is we should start with the simplest way for experiences to affect credences, which is just this idea that your credences should just match your proto-competences. You know, you have some proto-competences and then make your credences just say the same thing. The only difference would be instead of being related um, to the propositions that get assigned these probabilistic values, instead of being related in a doxastic credence way, you'd be related in the level of perception in the proto-confidence way. So you're just like changing the relation, but you're keeping everything else the same. But that's a very simple idea. So I want to talk about the idea. So um, I need to explain a little bit about the relationship between experience and conditionalization rules, which I'll do. Um, and then I'm going to just go through um, you know, developing and criticizing this matching idea for both the doxastic destination um, version of the thought that perceptual, that proto-competences help us understand this interface, and then I'm going to do the same thing for the rational contribution part. Um, okay, and yeah. Um, and just to not leave you in suspense, I don't think it helps so much at all. Um, but it's very interesting. Okay, so here we go. So proto-competences, they, they have their clearest um, epistemic role in the context of Bayesian theories of credences with Jeffrey conditionalization. So here's what I mean by Bayesian theory of credences. It's just two um, theses. So the first one is that at a time, your credences um, should conform to axioms of probability. And then the second thing is that there are rules for responding to new information that are conditionalization rules. Um, I'm just going to, uh, I'm going to skip over and only come back to it if we need to. Um, strict, what strict conditionalization um, is, and tell you about the one I'm going to talk most about, um, which is Jeffrey conditionalization, and that's the name for the idea that your your evidence, the stuff that you respond to, can actually be a probability distribution rather than a certainty. So, on um, the picture of Jeffrey conditionalization, um, having an experience can just jolt you into some local set of credences over a partition that's made salient by the experience, um, and um, and then conditionalization is a way of rearranging the rest of your mind in response to this initial adjustment of your credences. So Jeffrey's example um, was that if you see a cloth in dim light, it looks kind of bluish greenish, maybe a little bit purple, and it, you couldn't honestly answer the question like, is the cloth green just by saying yes or no? So if you want to fully express your opinion, you just need the kind of language that's the hallmark of degree confidence, like quite possibly blue, maybe green, just possibly purple purple and so on. Um, so on this, on this picture, this is not, I'm not yet telling you anything about proto-competence. I'm just telling you, um, just trying to explain the basic idea of Jeffrey um, conditionalization or an assumption it starts from, which is that your experience somehow, it's not theorized how, um, just got you into this initial adjustment of your credences um, from like, you know, probably green, etc. Um, and then and then, you, and then what the Jeffrey rule tells you to do is like how to rearrange the rest of your mind. Okay, now, um, on the motivation for proto-confidence that I'm talking about, if experiences are proto-confidences, then we can explain um, very straightforwardly how you get to this initial effect on your credences. Okay, 
Okay, so how do we get to just the starting point of death reconditionalization? Um, and we can do that. Uh, well, we can do that. So here is Jessie Munton, who is articulating this idea. She says, like in favor of proto-conferences, she says, Jeff reconditionalization allows that the evidence on which a subject updates, that's meaning the initial adjustment of the credences that the Jeff rule tells you what to, you know, how, how that thing should affect the rest of your mind, um, uh, need not have a probability of one. But this raises a prior question that has so far gone unanswered. What determines the probability that visual evidence receives? How does that evidence take a graded form if the experiential state itself is binary? There's a mismatch between the form of the visual state and that of the belief state that responds to it, whereas proto conferences allow justification to be direct and degree. So that's what she's saying in favor of proto conferences. They're supposed to correct this mismatch of form that she's describing. Okay. Okay. So how does it correct that mismatch of form? So the simplest way for it to do that is via this this matching thesis, the one that tells you about what your doxastic destination should be. So as I formulated here on page four. Um, if you should adjust your credences in response to an experience at all, then it says, okay, structure your credences with the same partition and the same distribution over it as your protoconferences have. That's the matching bit. Okay, and just to emphasize, because it's easy to get confused about this, at least for me, maybe also for you, anybody, um, what does that have to do with Jeffrey conditionalization? Um, it's just that it, 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 has not, it doesn't have to do with, okay, what it has to do with Jeffrey conditionalization is it's addressing this interface between your experience and the initial local set of credences. So um, I have the reason I haven't even stated the Jeffrey rules because we're not talking about it. We're talking about this earlier transition. Okay. So, but it's useful to have a label for this the credences that get adjusted by in, initially in response to your experience. So I'm going to call those things the credences that should reverberate through your mind according to Jeffrey conditionalization, or just the credences that should reverberate. That's what Mountain is calling the evidence on which the subject updates. Okay. Um, good. So, I'm now going to tell you some limitations of the matching thesis. Um, you may already have seen this, but I'm just going to go through it anyway. Okay, so first case has to do with aggregating experiences. So suppose you hear a big gong, gong, you know, you hear it. Okay, and then you turn around and then you see a gong. So the sound has just stopped. And then while you're looking at the gong, then you hear it again. Okay, so hear a gong, see a gong, hear and see a gong. Both. Okay. Now, if you think about what's happening to you epistemically in the sequence of experiences, your auditory experience, let's just say, sorry, let me say something first. Let's say when you hear the gong, it's very, very gong-like. So your auditory experience by itself gives you stronger reason than your exper visual experience does. You know, the gong makes this noise distinctive of metal, whereas from the distance you're at, it just looks only sort of gongish. Okay, now intuitively, when you both hear and see a gong, you've got more reason from your experience um, for supporting it's a gong than you have from just hearing it without seeing it or seeing it without hearing it. So over this very short time scale, you're accumulating reasons to increase your credence. But if all we, if, if we just followed the matching idea, then, um, then we can't accommodate that. So, okay, so protoconfidence is because they involve these, you know, assigning, um, the protoconfidence, sorry, the protoconfidence analysis, it can reflect some features of this case. Um, for example, it can posit like a higher code of confidence from, for the auditory one than for the visual one. Um, it could even say, okay, there's this audiovisual experience, one thing, that gets something higher than, a value even higher than the auditory one by itself. It can reflect those comparisons, but it can't accommodate what happens when they accumulate. Um, because think about it, what it's saying. It's saying, okay, when you first hear the gong, according to the matching thesis, your credence should be 0.8. But then when you see it, then you match all over again, now it should be 0.6. So you're going down, but you should go down, you know, you're accumulating. Okay, so what's needed is you need some way to aggregate the protoconfidences, and that's just something that has to be theorized. It's not like you just add them up, because then you get something over one, and that's no good. Okay, so you need some theory. Now, there are other limitations that I think illustrate the same sort of basic idea. Um, let's think about, instead of accumulating experiences, just combining your experiences with other priors. So um, going back to the cat in the fog or the tree in the fog, here it's a tree, the cat has morphed into a tree. Um, so if you compare the, um, you know, if you compare the, the two cats or the two trees, uh, one's in the fog, one's uh, in the clear sky, the um, proto should be, by this phenomenal constraint, they should be lower in the foggy case than they are in the unfoggy case. Um, now, the matching thesis tells you to make your credences match your proto But sometimes, um, you know, sometimes 
when you see a tree in a fog, you already know it's a tree. Um, you planted it. So it's not like you should lower your credence, you know, just because it's foggy. So again, matching is not having any way to accommodate the relationship between experience and other states you're in. I'm just going to give you another uh, type of example of that. Um, um, penguins are birds, you might know that. Um, so if you see some penguin waddle and clap its wings, you might be more strongly presented with it's a penguin than it's a bird. Birds don't usually clap, but they do have wings. Um, but then according to your priors, if it's a penguin, it's definitely a bird. So if you think of the proto-competence in the situation, it should be like point 0.8, if it's a penguin, for example, point 0.2, it's a bird. Um, but in the matching thesis says, um, the credences that should reverberate your mind, through your mind are ones that are going to entail more likely penguin than bird. Or I have another example in case you don't like penguins in experience, you know, more likely glass than liquid or something. Um, um, and intuitively, it's not like you should back off of these commitments that if it's a penguin, it's a bird, or if it's a glass. Okay, so the same point um, is illustrated, I think, by these two types of cases, which is just that how an experience affects your credences, how it should affect your credences, should sometimes be sensitive to things other than that very experience, like other experiences, or other parts of the same experience, or your background belief. Now, that point is obvious, I think, in the case of defeat. Like, if you know the wall is not red, but it looks red, you shouldn't adjust your credences to match your experience as it's being red. But so far as I can tell, defeat is just this kind of special case of this general phenomenon that how an experience should initially affect your credence should sometimes be sensitive to these other factors um, besides that very experience. Okay. Um, so um, we need some way of like calculating the, we need some way of calculating, you know, making a, having a calculus of the factors that determine the correct doxastic destination you should reach in response to your experience. Um, and matching, uh, um, matching itself doesn't give you the right idea. I think the bigger question is, if you have, does the formalism help? You know, if you can't just match, um, but you need some theory of how we can combine, is it going to help you, help us, if we have experiences with the, you know, if we if we think of them as proto competences? I don't know. So I'm going to answer that question because I know the answer. Okay. Um, um, okay. I'm going to skip. I'm going to tell you the main point of section six without talking through it because I want to get make sure I get to the end. Um, okay. Uh, there's another issue that matching thesis itself doesn't address, and I don't think, the, and I think it's pretty clear that the proto confidence formalism doesn't help us address either, but is certainly relevant to the question of what your doxastic destination should be in response to your experience. And that's the issue of whether you should actually make any adjustment at all to your credences in response to your experience. So, obviously, in the case of defeat, um, maybe in some cases, very strong cases of defeat, you, you, you shouldn't. Um, but there are other types of considerations um, having to do with, you know, whether you should bother adjusting your mind at all um, that proto-confidence don't speak to. So these are things I, I guess I'd have to do, for example, cost of inquiry. I guess I will give you just one example. Um, no, I'm not going to give you example. Okay, um, we can talk about that in other... Uh, I, the, the main point of... The main point I um, uh, would have gone through if I had more time is that um, your experience might uh, give you some new information, but I don't think that um, I don't think it's obvious that you should always use it. Um, it might be crappy information. It might be just better to wait for better information. Um, it might be that you don't care. You know, um, it might be the cost of inquiry and calculation are too high. And so, okay, so that's a thought I'll put on the tape. Now, um, you might okay. So that was all on the strand of discussing whether proto competences help us in determining um, the what how we should actually adjust our mind in response to how we should actually adjust our credences initially in response to experience. Okay, so that's one kind of question you could ask is like, look, what should I do with my mind? I have this experience, what should I do with my mind? What should I do with my credences? Okay, um, and that's what I was calling the doxastic destination motivation for proto competences. Now you might think it was just wrong to think, you know, that maybe that's Maybe we should instead think that proto competence will shine a lot brighter if we ask a different type of question. Instead of asking, where should my mind actually end up? Maybe we should ask, what, what should experience contribute to that, where my mind ends up? Instead of trying to um, you know, rely on proto competences to give a whole theory, which is not really suited to give, because there's all these other factors that determine where my mind should actually end up. Maybe we should just ask um, whether proto competences help us um, identify the contribution from our experience to where we should end up. Okay. 
Okay, because it's obviously taking this whole world of epistemological theory to tell us when our experiences should match our proto competences and when they shouldn't. Um, so I want to shift gears to asking whether um, it's illuminating to that the, the proto the, the, the putting experiences into this probabilistic framework does that help us analyze the rational contribution of experience? Okay. Um, now there is two ways that that there's two ways that you might try to isolate um, a proprietary contribution from experience using proto-confidences. One is a different matching thesis, one that says, if you have a proto-confidence point n in P, then you should have, then you have a little bit of justification, some pro-tanto justification to adopt that very same preference. So if I have a proto-confidence point 8 in, um, it's a gong, then, then on this analysis, I have proto, I have a little bit of justification for adopting that credence. So here, degrees of perceptual seeming are going to rise and fall with degrees of confidence in which you have, I said proto here, I meant proton justification. Okay, and then a different idea. So here, we're, we're just keeping, there's only one degree thing in the picture. Well, here, there are two degree things in the pictures. There's your credences, obviously, and there is your proto-confidences. Um, now, a, a different way of developing a similar thought is that your proto conferences are instead measuring how much epistemic support you have. So here are we like we're saying we're, we're, we're talking about justification as being the thing that comes in degrees. See what I mean? Um, so we have potentially like three potentially degree things: experiences, credences, and justification. Okay, so on the on the matching thesis for the rational contribution, it doesn't try to talk about justification as coming in degrees. It just says you you know it it, it says um, here. It, well, okay, I already told this. Okay, so now I'm just going to mention these problems and I'll stop so we have some time for discussion. Um, and these are problems for both, well, uh, these are these are problems for the matching pieces, but I think they extend to uh, the other version as well. Okay, so here's the problem as I see it. Um, the credences you have, some initial justification to form, don't rise and fall with the strength of perceptual seeming. And in a way, we've already seen examples of this. Um, like if you think of these triangles, um, you see these triangles, you have just as much justification for thinking it's a triangle in both cases. Um, okay, thanks to the amazing miracle of visual completion. Um, and same with blue. It's not like you have less justification for thinking that it's blue. Um, and um, okay, and then a third type of example involves shape constancy. So Munton, and Jesse Munton, who I mentioned before in the same paper that I quoted from before, um, has an example that she uses to motivate proto-confidences. She says, you see a box. As you turn away, it moves into your peripheral vision. If you isolated your experience of it from the corner of your eye, and that was all you had to go on, you might get less evidence from that experience than you'd get from looking at the box straight on. Okay, I think this is um, overgeneralized. So you don't have to get less justification. I mean, shape stays constant as you turn away. You can also visually experience a box in your periphery. We could even try this as an experiment. Um, so what's different between peripheral and focal vision is strength of perceptual seeming, um, but it's not necessarily a difference in epistemic support. So these things just aren't going to rise and fall together. So that's what I think is a problem with that other idea. OK. Um, and now I just want to end with a um, uh, uh, point about the relationship between strength of perceptual seemings, which I think is a real thing, and the probabilistic formalism that purports to analyze it, um, which is that if you, what the formalism brings to the table, one thing it brings, is the idea that there's an upper bound on how, for, how forcefully you can be presented in experience with something. So there's a way, it's such a thing as maxing out. And I just raise this as a question for you. Um, you know, do you think there's like, Maximal, is this maximally perceptually present? Maybe your cat is more perceptually present. Um, um, it's not obvious to me that it really does kind of, there's such a thing as maxing, maxing out. But the formalism, you know, hands us that as a thing. And you could say, okay, look, it just hands us that, but isn't that just kind of gratuitous, yet harmless precision? Um, and I think, no, if we're supposed to make sense of how these psychological relations differ from one another um, in this formalism, then what we're doing is, you know, you have to be able to take some point in this interval between zero and one as understood, like, for example, a perceptual analog of certainty or agnosticism or something, and then define all the other relations, um, all the other degree relations um, in terms of it. And so if there's no such thing as, like, 
you know, one, assigning one to perceptual seeming, then the, the formalism is, it isn't, uh, there's, no, there's no psychological thing that the formalism is helping us to analyze. Like when you use a formalism, you use it because you think in the mind there's something that's structured um, enough like, it's structured in a way that's isomorphic to the formalism, and that's why the formalism is supposed to be helpful. So, um, okay. But if there's no such thing as maxing out um, in perceptual seeming, then the formalism's um, unmotivated. And another thing to think through uh, along the same lines is that um, the formalism gives us a single linear measure so that any two cases of differences in perceptual strength are supposed to be comparable. Um, but you know, when I think of these examples, I think, well, which is more, which is more strongly present? Is it the drawn triangle or is it the front lit cat? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure I can locate them all. I'm saying. Okay, so um, those are my reasons for thinking that. Though it would be really nice to think, oh, a unified framework for analyzing the cognitive underpinnings of cognitive perturbation and also its epistemic impact. Um, I don't think we're going to get it through proto -conferences. That doesn't mean we wouldn't get it through some probabilistic framework, but it won't be a probabilistic framework that assimilates experiences to the making them have the same structure as creatives.